Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I hope you're uh, having a nice day here, even though it's just a little nip in the air. Um, from those of you who know that I'm from Iowa, this is called a nip in the air. <laughs> anyway, recycling is one of those issues that people know a lot about but don't know anything about in, in reality. Um, because there's, there's so much technology that's out there today that can be used. And the interesting thing is the total effects that you can get uh, if you do it correctly, and if you do it in the right format and so forth. So what I want you to walk away with today is basically trying to answer the question for a one word question, potential. What is the potential that's out there? And I'm gonna kind of share with you a few things here with respect to the potential. I always like to start with telling everybody that I, when as an engineer, I try to make sure that I'm looking at everything from these five different uh, standpoints, uh, making sure that everything's going to work with the system. And I always try to remind my students that we have to make sure that we are not just technically sound, you know, technologically sound in terms of our technologies, at least, but they have to fill all those other four variables in their design process. And so with that, um, my presentation is kind of an interesting one because it's totally interactive. I move all over the place, so I come back to this page on a regular basis. But if you look at recycling and so forth, you have to look at it from a sustainability standpoint. And I put this together because I've talked with uh, everybody from politicians in Washington to um, uh, down-home farmers trying to figure out what they can do in their situation, and it's all in one slide, or one talk. So rather than going through the 130 slides that I have, which I know you don't want to hear, especially in only 10 minutes, um, I'm going to talk about just a few of the par parts of it. So let me start by uh, looking at the uh, potential. So you ever ask yourself the question, how much electrical energy does the U.S. consume? Anyone have any idea? How much power consumption capability do they have? Well, it turns out that they have about 800,000 megawatts of power availability and using it somewhere in the neighborhood of 600, so I think it's probably now up to 630 and so forth. But what does that mean to you? Now, and also taking a look at it from the standpoint of animals. Let's just take animal manure production in the United States. If we took all of that manure and just simply took the dry biomass and converted it to electricity in a gasification system, you can see the potential energy that we can produce, a little under 35,000 megawatts. It's not a drop in a bucket, but it's a fairly large potential of energy that we could produce. Now, the, the, the main point here to consider is the fact that um, when, when you look at this total energy, um, of course, everyone has seen all the reports about cows and they're belching and they're passing gas and so forth and all the methane you're putting into the atmosphere. Well, if you really look at it in comparison to 300 million tons of the what byproduct they leave behind, the stuff they're putting into the atmosphere is relatively minor in comparison to what this puts into the atmosphere. So if we really want to solve one major problem of CO2 and methane going into the atmosphere, we need to start with the big part. Let's, let's take the, the easy thing to fix first. And so, um, <clears throat> and then I wanted to divert your attention just a little bit to looking at water, all right? And, and think about how much water do we have available for human consumption on this earth? And let's just take it by country if you want to. Now, I, I, it seems like I'm really being diversion, divergent here with my, my conversation, but let me tell you, they connect, and they, they, they have a direct connection. And what's interesting is these slides are, this picture here represents something I've been doing with my wastewater. Think about it. Gives you some numbers. This is cubic meters per person of fresh water we have available for consumption. All right, that basically takes care of what we need so we can consume. So uh, this is an idea of how much is around. So notice here what happens from 1980-90 time frame to the 1990-2000 time frame. I'm working on the next series of numbers on it right now. They've dropped considerably. But the key here is, is looking at this we have almost an order of magnitude difference in the numbers as they drop from one country to the next, Canada, US, and so forth. I've been to Jordan, and it's quite interesting. 
to see what they have to do with their water. So thinking of this for just a second, he has to answer one question. How much water do you consume every day on average? Any idea what you consume? Several hundred gallons. Several hundred gallons. Much less if you have water your lawn. Well, much less if you water your lawn. That is definitely correct. Um, but you don't think about the fact that there's water consumed to make your clothes. There's water consumed to build your computers. So if you start taking all those things into account, what do you think that number looks like? It turns out to be almost 500 gallons per day per person for all the different things that we do in our lives. This is a worldwide number. So what I did basically was I went out and, and did a quick calculation of time when I said, all right, well, we have so much water that hits the earth. That's renewable water. There's so much that's lost to ET and precipitation. There's some others that's lost from, from just general use. And then there's the potential that you can capture. And out of that potential that you can capture, how much is usable? Because some of it hits the ocean and you can't use it for drinking purposes. Um, so we technically end up with a certain amount of what we consider to be reusable water. Basically, if we use this number and divide that into there, we can handle a population no more than 18 or 14 billion people. Those numbers will be revised and that number will probably be dropping in my next revision for this work. But I'm finding this to be kind of an interesting thing to think about. And so what, why, why is that important? It really becomes important when we start talking about the technologies um, in terms of doing the recycling because for everything that we recycle that's been used once before, and that, yes, all water is recycled, okay? I mean, that's the natural hydrologic cycle. So let's not get into that. But let's talk about it from the standpoint of, um, of using these major sources of water, wastewater. Lubbock recycles about 20 million or 16 million gallons per day of their effluent on the land. Well, what can we do with all that? That's recycling it for water purposes. And you say, well, the technology's not there. Well, I beg to differ with you. The technology is there. And let's just take in to a, an example, a CAFO, or an animal feeding operation. And let's just look at cattle because that's wide, widely used in this area. I always want people to walk away from my talk with just a little bit of an image that, uh, that they will never forget. If we take all the waste from the Texas High Plains, from the cattle that's produced, and we stick it over in Jones Stadium to fill it up, how long do you think it'll take me to fill it? Just the Texas High Plains cattle. Any idea? I get a wide range of answers on this question. Eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's not allowed for him to answer my question because he's heard me say this before, but he's actually almost wrong, or he's actually wrong and you're really way off. Uh, you can fill it twice a day. So, I mean, that gives you a rather visual impact here of how much material we get to work with every day. Uh, you say, get to work with. Um, you gotta remember it. Your waste is my bread and butter. Okay, so, and that's why I don't quit my day job, because I'm not a comedian. So we can go through these different processes here. For example, if we go through anaerobic digestion, we can capture all the methane gas that's being produced, and we'll be capturing a lot of the CO2 that's used. If we capture that, you can burn the methane to produce energy, all right? Um, you can take the byproduct from that and essentially run it in your aquatic plant system. And then you can take that and, and the water from there and continue to grow fish or other things. All of these things are possible because you're saying, wait a second, Growing fish off of cattle manure just doesn't sound very appetizing. Well, you don't raise fish that you're going to eat. You raise fish that go into the aquarium market. These are all the species of fish that I've tested in our system using the water that came out of it, recycling cattle waste. And they survive. As it turns out, they actually get better than using straight Lubbock water. That's not saying anything negative about Lubbock's water, okay? All that's saying is, is there's a little difference in my water. If you look at my water, it's coming out of a greenhouse and we're growing different <coughs> plants that can be utilized. 
So now let's look back here in terms of biomass. Remember the USDA just put out a report, the 1.2 billion tons of biomass that's available on the earth through agriculture and everything else that goes on that we can use and make energy, okay? So if we were to look at those kind of things, we would see that they would be choosing things such as alfalfa. Switchgrass is a big one, all right? You see what kind of production rates we can get from that? Water hyacinths, we can go up to as high as 80 tons per acre per year in terms of their production. Now, you have to have the right environment to make that happen. I've been growing them out in my greenhouse at 45 tons per acre per year. These numbers are all going to make sense in a little while. Duckweed is just a fantastic plant. Now, you notice here there's kind of a theme behind all of the different plants I'm working with. They're all photosynthetic. They all consume fairly large amounts of CO2. Duckweed in its most productive state will double its mass in two days in its optimal growth levels. So you can grow a lot of duckweed in a very short period of time. I have, and that is what I was using to feed my fish. The water coming off of there still has a lot of, of uh, my other microorganisms and algae especially in it. So that also enhanced the growing of my fish. And I don't know how many of you know this, but when you start talking about the fish, and I always talk about the various types, like tilapia, because I can hand hardy little boogers, my goodness, they can live in really bad water, even in high density populations. But, you know, the interesting thing here is it's really hard to get a good picture of a good, uh, colorful fish. You notice all the color in there? Well, these fish wouldn't have that color if they weren't fed the right algae and so forth. That algae is so easy to produce from recycling water if you use it from the right nutrients and so forth. Okay, so let's to go back to potential. I gave you the broad spectrum here because I only get 10 minutes with you. Um, we have a lot of waste that's being produced by the different animals and so forth. What can we do with it? Remember the numbers I told you in terms of uh, energy? If I take the waste and go directly, I can get 35,000 megawatts of energy. If I produce methane gas, I can get about 17,000 megawatts. If I take that same waste and recycle it to grow water hyacinths only, I have enough energy to produce 500,000 megawatts of energy. See where I'm going? This is the potential that's out there. Now think about that in terms of how much CO2 is being consumed in this process. So there's a lot that's getting consumed in the process. And so with that, I kind of just leave this rather complicated diagram to indicate here that really what we're talking about is if you integrate your technologies, if you work with the various technologies that we have available and integrate them correctly, it's absolutely amazing what you can do with it. And the potential is there for us to do almost anything and cost effectively too. I also found out from my studies with the gentleman in, in industrial engineering where they did the economic analysis that the more integration we do, the better the income level comes on these <coughs> processes. And I've got a couple of those articles that are out on my website if you ever want to look at them. So with that, I'm going to open the floor for questions so that I don't get the bad finger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Cliff, uh, how much water comes out of the Amazon Basin and the Congo as you know, two big rivers that uh, are, in a sense, uh, surplus or, you know, the fresh water? You know, I, I remember reading some numbers on that, but I will have to admit to you uh, that I don't remember exactly what it is. It's a large volume of water yeah. that's going down there and, and essentially ending up in the ocean. But nonetheless, we don't need to worry about that because the ocean needs to be replenished from time to time as well, right? So it's part of the natural cycle here that we have to work with. What I'm more concerned about here is, is if we're using the water today, and all we do is simply flush the commode and it goes away and we don't worry about it anymore. Um, we're not being very good stewards of our water. But see, the whole thing here kind of comes full circle around. 
if we take care of our water correctly and recycle it correctly, then we're taking care of another problem, and that's getting rid of the waste. All right, getting rid of the waste is getting rid of the nutrients, and getting rid of the nutrients is actually producing something. So if you look at this in, 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 in terms of complete recycling, I never call this a closed loop system, by the way. So there's no such thing in reality. Only Mother Nature has the ability to do that for us, and we don't come close to her. Um, we can actually make money from our waste if you do it correctly. I basically talked to the Texas Society of Professional Engineers one time and I, I left them with one little word of advice and I said, in the future, what I expect to see from us engineers is that whenever we design and build a wastewater treatment system, that it is designed at no cost to the, to the consumers. Most of them just looked at me and shook their head and said, oops, he's a little out there. But someday that's exactly what it will be. It may not be in my lifetime, but it will be happening. Has to. So that's the end of my time because I think oh, she's buzzed me. <laughs> it did. Oh, is that? Oh, I thought that was your timer telling me to be quiet. Uh, no. I think okay, you had a question? I think we can get one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, a couple of things. I might disagree on the closed loop. I think the way some people think about climate change is a pretty closed loop. But we won't go there, so forgive me on that one. <laughs> That's just right. kidding. <laughs> I was talking about my system, not yours. Uh, you know, you know has no systems. <laughs> That's why I, when I was in the consulting business, I loved working with engineers because everything was so simple and clear. But the question is, I love it. This, this makes so much sense from a policy standpoint and someone who works in that area. How do you get it started? Yeah. Let's, What's the pilot project we need to do to get this started? Because it seems like it's in everybody's interest, and if it's so simple, what the hell are we doing? Or what are we not doing? Well, there's, there's my greenhouse that no longer exists. I, I built it in 95, hoping it would last me five years. I just took it down this, just this last year. Wow. So, and, and what's funny about this is almost everything in here, with the exception of this tank and the fans, is all recycled material, by the way. I live by what I preach. And um, in this greenhouse is where I was doing all these different types of tests on the different types of plants and so forth. So mm -hmm. this is what it's going to take to get one started. I mean, a real and pilot project. I mean, there are going to be stakeholder groups that could be approached and say, hey, we'll put up the money or some and funding have, agencies can put up the money. Let's see what happens. I have worked with groups all over the place. I've talked with politicians. Of course, politicians look at this and they say, that's just a big hole in the ground full of water. It's no, not, nothing exciting. So it's, you know, there's nothing yes. spectacular that grabs their attention. It's hard to win an election on a hole in the ground. Yeah. You got that one right. But um, I, I have people all over the world that, have, and in fact, I'm going to China this summer to talk about this, uh, because they seem to have a very high interest in wanting to use, utilize the recycling technology. But they, they're, you know, this, this really thing this boils down to really three things. The water balance, an energy balance, and uh, the, the mass balance, the solids balance through the system. And if you look at those three things and you match them with the different processes that you have, then you can optimize the technologies that you need to use for that particular location. Yeah. Now, I can grow fish in West Texas and, and grow these different feeds because I have a marketplace where I could sell every one of those things without any issues. But in another part of the country, I may not have that same market. So, what you do is you just adapt your production system to produce what you can sell and market in those different regions. Yeah, but you get to that high-end energy production. That's going to take a little bit more than just selling to local markets, right? Actually, you know, to you mean yeah, the high-end three hundred fifty okay. megawatt hours? Okay. Um, let me go back to my um, diagram and I'll show you. This is the gasifier system. There's the one picture and this is another picture. This unit right here is uh, two are four feet high and two feet in diameter. That's the heart of the entire piece of equipment. That thing alone converts all the biomass into energy. Mm -hmm. The rest of this is nothing more than supporting it. Like these tanks over here separate all the gases out right. so that you basically consume it and you, you know, this whole piece of equipment essentially exceeds EPA requirements for air quality and so forth. So it collects all the ash out the bottom here and these are just blowers to separate those gases and so forth. All the excess gas coming off of the engine can then just simply be used uh, in the aquaculture system. So you're saying it's very scalable? It is. Yeah. This is a one megawatt unit. 
And the way I would build them is I would build them in five megawatt minutes. And so if I have a 50,000 head feedlot, I have enough energy to produce five megawatts of energy just from the biomass that they produce. If I bring in the water hyacinth production, yes, if I bring in the water hyacinth production, then I would have to scale up the energy here because I could produce 14 times the energy by going to the water hyacinths and recycling all that water and the waste. So basically every feedlot should have a pond of water hyacinths beside it. Well, <laughs> it, would, uh, it would be very beneficial if they did, if they yeah. were using it and converting it to electrical energy. You know, this is probably, this is the most complicated part of the entire system if you're going to use it for electrical energy production. And so I've actually designed systems where um, we don't even bother with this. We just simply look at growing all the different aquatic plants that I can mix into animal feeds, into fish feeds, and grow my fish, and a few things like that. So again, it just depends upon how you want to design your system and how technologically savvy you want to get with it. Um, so it, it's, it's all essentially scalable. The way I look at it is no two systems are ever going to look alike. And they shouldn't if you're optimizing it. Thank you, Cliff. That was fascinating. That was fascinating.